Ecclesiastes chapter 3 tonight. We're going to be picking up in verse 12 and closing out the rest of the chapter. So last time we were here in Ecclesiastes 3, we looked at really one verse and looked at two statements in that verse. And one of that was in verse 11 where it says, He has made everything beautiful in his time. And then that he has put eternity in their hearts. Now remember that the writings of Ecclesiastes is a worldview through the lens of man's fallen condition. That's really what it is. Um, we have a clear picture in the Bible of a different view, God's view. God's view of creation is found in Two chapters, chapters one and two of Genesis, where God created everything and out of God's own mouth, those words that spoke the world into existence said it was good. It was good. And then we see that God continued on with that. God gave man a purpose. God gave man life. God gave the world that we see its beauty. He also gave it its grandeur, its power. He gave it all that our eyes see and at times are fascinated with. But what God did not give this world was chapter 3 of Genesis where sin entered the world and we see that from that point on, all that God created that was good now was not easily enjoyed because sin has changed everything. So Solomon, at one point in time, the wisest man in the world, faltered in his view of God and the things of God. And Solomon begins to give us a perspective of life from Earth's vantage point. And he highlights a lot of things. What is the meaning? What is the purpose? If all these things continue as they are, you know, he talks about work. He talks about that things are meaningless, that vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And here he's continuing on with that. But there's things that he highlights. He, he has a tendency to pull out the good. And I believe that comes from the wisdom that God gave him in the time in which he walked in that wisdom. So this is where he continues when he says he has made everything beautiful in its time. Remember, ultimately what he's saying is that time is meaningless without God, right? Without God's timing, so to speak. But he says everything has its season. Everything has its time. And so he makes everything beautiful in his time. That's something that I think can encourage us that no matter the outcome or circumstance in life, the idea behind this verse and the next couple of verses is what Paul writes in Romans chapter 8 in verses 28 and 29. Now remember, we look at this passage of scripture that Paul writes and we use it as an encouraging verse and it does bring encouragement to our heart notice what it says in verse 28 of romans chapter 8 it says and we know that all things work together for good to those who love god to those who are called according to his purpose that all things work together for good to those who love god so this is a verse that we often tell people when they say, well, I'm experiencing this or going through this or life is difficult right now. Times are tough. And we say, hey, listen, the hope that we have as Christians is that God works all things out for his good. That's the way we phrase that verse, right? We say it that way. But Paul here is reminding us, though God does work out all things for our good, because God is good. We talked about the omnibenevolence of God. There's never a time when God is not good. He's always good. He's God. Remember the story of the rich young ruler. 
We studied this a few weeks back on Wednesday night as we're in Mark's gospel. And he comes to Jesus and he says, you know, good teacher. And Jesus stops him and he says, why do you call me good? No one is good but God. And in essence, the rich young ruler didn't realize that he was actually calling Jesus God. And Jesus in that statement was admitting that he was God. But that is true. None is good except God. And initially when God created everything, listen, God created it good. Do you know that right now people would look at us and let's just say they look at our past, they look at our life and they judge us according to how we've lived up until this day. For most of us, if not all of us, I would say, and I believe this to be true, our bad outweighs our good. Because by nature, we are rebellious. We are bad. We are distracted. We are misguided. And so if we were to be judged according to these things, the bad always outweighs the good. But because of who God is, we have no goodness in us. The Bible speaks of righteousness, right? Well, for the believer, the New Testament says we are clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So the only good that we do have is Christ in us. The Bible says, as Paul writes to the believers, the hope of glory. The good that we have comes from God. God is good. So that's a powerful statement. And yes, for those who love God, God works things out for our good. But God also works out good even for those who reject God. It's something that puzzles our mind when Jesus himself even says it rains on the just and the unjust. We see good things happen for people that we really feel don't deserve it. I know you guys have never felt that way. You see somebody get blessed, like, why them? You know, it, it should have been me. I deserve that. I mean, God, look at after all, I'm here at church on a Sunday night. Come on. They never come on Sunday night. <laughs> Sometimes we have in our flesh a tendency to, to think that the goodness of God is, in a sense, perhaps maybe brought about by our doing like in some way that we can influence God's goodness in our lives, that we can, we can call and demand his goodness. No, God is good even when our life is a mess. Then he goes on to say this, that God works out together for the good, all things for the good, for those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Now, now this means here that even though it rains on the just and the unjust, as Jesus says, and remember, the Lord even spoke in the Old Testament to Moses. He says, I will bless who I want to bless. I will do what I want to do to whomever I do it to because I'm the Lord God. I'm in control, right, of these things. Now, this is to show. The Bible says it is the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. That is a clear indication that a person who has not repented will experience the goodness of God for a purpose, to lead them to repentance. So sometimes we don't feel that a person deserves forgiveness because maybe the infraction was done to you and me. But did you know that there was a point in time when Satan worked against God's forgiveness in your life? When the enemy of our soul in no way believes or has ever believed that we deserve the goodness of God in our lives. The beauty of it is that God's goodness not only brings us and leads us to repentance, God even more so is good to those who are his. Just think about the person that doesn't know God and experiences goodness versus the person who does know God and knows that he is good even more so. We relish, we should be, relishing in the fact that the Lord is good and he's faithful. Amen. But look at what else it goes on to say. For him, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed into the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. 
Moreover, whom he predestined, he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Now I love that. Why? Because God is the one who justifies. And notice this here. Where do we see this? Well, the goodness of God is that, but what is the road to this? We could see here that Paul continues on in Romans chapter 8, and he's saying, yes, God works things out for the good, for those who are called according to his purpose, and those he foreknew, he predestined. And notice this, and he says, and those whom he predestined, it says, he also called. And those he called, he justified. Notice, this is God's doing. And what is God doing? He's calling and he's justifying out of darkness into his marvelous light. And so what he's saying here is, yes, you experience the goodness of God, but you also experience the darkness of this world. In a sense, he's saying, we live in between heaven and earth, and we live in between the uncertainty of what comes next. We know that God is eternal. We know that God is good. But we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Because tomorrow's not promised to any of us. We can assume. We can try to apply in the context of our lives these things. But ultimately, notice this, that Solomon then kind of continues with the same thought. And he says this, verse 12 of chapter 3. He says, I know that nothing is better for them than to rejoice and to do good in their lives. And also that every man should eat, drink, and enjoy the good of all his labor. Listen to this. It is the gift of God. Now, what I think is interesting here is that God makes everything beautiful in his time, that God has put eternity in man's hearts. This, the thought here is really important for us to understand. You know, God is good and will make everything beautiful. And notice how it says here, in its time. God is in control of time. He makes it very clear here. But he puts eternity in our hearts. And what does that mean for you and me? Well, this goes back to the question that people ask. What is my purpose in life? What is the meaning of life? Why am I here? People ask those questions. Is this all there is to life? When you and I get tired or have gotten tired of living life that just constantly chews us up and spits us out, we ask this question, is this all there is? Now, the person that understands that there's a better life is the person that experienced the grace of God and their life has been radically transformed. Then you realize now there's way more meaning to life. Well, where do you think those questions come from? They come from God putting eternity in our heart. Knowing that God is in control of time, listen to this, guys, and that God has made us in his image, this changes everything. He says, I know that nothing is better for them than to rejoice and to do good in their lives because God makes everything beautiful in its time and because God has put eternity in our hearts and because God works all things out for the good. And listen to this, though we see the good for us came through Christ's suffering, the same is for us. We will suffer, but ultimately in the end, God gets the glory. Good comes out of all of this pain. God is not a God who wastes things. God does not waste pain. It will eventually turn out for his good. So in essence, what Solomon is saying is that man's life can be enjoyed now. 
Now, I know that he uses these terms here that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor. That is true. I think sometimes we, we do that a little bit more than we should. Sometimes we do it with disregard to the one who has given it to us. But notice what the emphasis that he puts here that I think is important. It is the gift of God. And this is something that Solomon has highlighted, the preacher, if you will, has highlighted throughout. In verse 24 of chapter 2, he says, Nothing is better for a man that he should eat and drink and that his soul should enjoy good in his labor. This also, I saw, was from the hand of God. Initially, that's how God created it. He told Adam in the garden, he's like, he put him in the garden of Eden, right? And he said to him, he says, you know, just tend, keep the garden. I mean, really think about it, tend, keep the garden. He didn't say, you know, it's going to be tough. It's going to be hard. You know, you got this or that. No, I mean, however that was going to look, who knows? I mean, he didn't have to water it. They didn't have a sprinkler system. God provided the dew that provided the water to sustain the vegetation and the herbs and the grass and all of these things. And, and all he had to do was just there and be there and tend it and keep it. In other words, what God was saying is, remain in the presence of the Lord your God. That's a part of keeping. Remain there. Stay there. Listen to this. So the picture, I think, is beautiful. Now, in chapter 3, when man falls, now he's like, by the sweat of your brow, thorns and thistles. Now he says, the work in the garden of tending and keeping now is going to require sweat, blood, sweat, and tears. You're going to suffer now. So in essence, guys, listen to this. When God created us, he didn't create us to suffer. The world, our choice, our choosing to disobey, man's choosing to disobey God, disobedience brought about suffering in our lives. But God even provided the way out of that. Jesus suffered the suffering of all sufferings, if you will. And Jesus suffered the wrath of all wraths, if you will. Jesus drank the cup of judgment. This is why Paul says in all of this here, when God does this work in us, as he stated in chapter 8, he, he, he kind of leads with this word that I, that I think is important here because he talks about the justice of God. In verse 33 of Romans 8, he says, it is God who justifies in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, and, or excuse me, chapter 2 and verse 24, he says this also is from the hand of God. In chapter 3, here in verse 12, he says that to enjoy the good of all his labor, it is a gift of God. Now, all of this has to do with the purpose that God created man for. Man needs to be justified. That's what this is, right? When you come to faith in Christ, it's called justification. And anybody that's been a part of the legal system here, you know, not that there's really too many here that have been part of the legal system, but, you know, to be justified is, that is your ticket out. Nobody can counteract that. Once the judge says, listen, you, you have been vindicated. You are justified. The word actually means as if there was never an infraction made against you. Spiritually speaking, it means as if you'd never seen That this is how God justifies us. Then we go through this process of sanctification because we need to be sanctified. God needs to work in us a little bit, right? And so we're in this process of sanctification. And then ultimately what's going to happen is we're going to experience what is called glorification, where we will be glorified. And this incorruption will take on incorruption. This mortal will take on immortality. This is what Paul speaks about in 1 Corinthians 15. This is what we tell our loved ones. This is what we tell our friends. This is what we tell others that, that listen, death is not the end. It's the beginning. There is life after death because God is eternal. 
God has put eternity in our heart. We respond to the eternality of God because of who he is. Now think about this. And this is what I think is remarkable about what Solomon highlights here. Because Solomon is not looking from the perspective of eternity. He's saying, hey, just enjoy your labor because your labor is a gift from God. I think that's true for us today, that basically what the Lord is saying to us, and we can maybe take a cue from here, and he's saying, enjoy your life. Enjoy your walk with the Lord. Enjoy it. But don't ever forget who gave you that life. In chapter 6 of Ecclesiastes, in verse to the Bible says here, a man to whom God has given riches and wealth and honor so that he lacks nothing for himself for all he desires. Yet God does not give him power to eat of it, but a foreigner consumes it. This is vanity and it is evil affliction. Notice what he says here. God gives riches and wealth and honor. You know, these things are God given. And why does God give us sustenance? Why does God give us these things? To enjoy. And the Bible's that great reminder. You know, I think that in some cases we have to always remember that the Lord clearly directs our hearts and reveals to us his purposes and his plans. I think here that notice that this reminder of why we have what we have is so that we can enjoy it, not be weighed down and burdened with it. Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 17, he says, command those who are rich in this present age not to be proud, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, listen to this, who gives us richly all things to enjoy. This is not just an Old Testament thing. This is a New Testament thing. And he gives us these things to enjoy. And one of the things we always encourage people with is that, you know, if God has blessed you, that's so you can enjoy those blessings. But it's never to the extent where we take the blessing and place it over the one who gave it to us. It's like we receive the gift and then we dismiss the gift giver. Because that's how the world lives. You know, and when you tell someone that, well, you know, really what you got is given to you by God. Oh, they freak out. God didn't do anything for me. I got this because I worked hard. Well, who gave you the breath of life in your lungs? You're only breathing by the grace of God. Listen, some people didn't wake up today. Breath was not in their lungs. And that's why every day when you open your eyes, you know how many people die in their sleep? They just, they don't wake up. And their life's at a halt. Everything that they were planning to do the next day, all the affairs they had, listen to this, and... And all of a sudden, it's just, it's halted, it's stopped. And those that are left here have to now pick up the pieces and navigate through everything to finish these affairs and whatever it is. I mean, really think about it. This here is this thing. You know, I was looking at some of the things that have been coming out since this mass shooting with these kids. I mean, just think about it, children. This is what, where we look at these things and, you know, I'm not going to get into this, you know, politicizing this thing and laws and, and, you know, and be accused as being a woke pastor. At the end of the day, here's what it boils down to. The issue is sin. We live in a fallen world. And... The only answer for a situation like this is the gospel. And I can prove it to you. Because there is a TikTok video going around of one of the girls that was nine years old that was murdered. And the day before she was murdered, she put a TikTok video out before she was going to bed. And her family says she's always done this. And she put a TikTok video out to her friends and said, I just want you guys to know that Jesus died for our sins so that when we die, we will be with him. And I thought that was amazing. And then her 
father had captured some pictures of her that before she would go to bed, she would pray for everybody. Where do you think that came from? Obviously, being brought up in church, raised in church, but really think about it. It kind of goes back to what Solomon is saying here, that God puts eternity in our heart. Someone this young understands that there is life after death. And yet the very next day, she steps into eternity. And here's the words, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. There was no fear of death. Her fear of death was, was absolved. It was obliterated by the very fact that Jesus died for her. So this nine-year-old statement is, when we die, that's what she said. When we die, we will go with him. And her little fingers just pointed up. We will go with him. Maybe that's a good picture of when Jesus said that we need to have faith like a child. Right? So some would say, you know, life is too short. Yes, it is. But death is no respecter of person. Here's what I will tell you. That little video for her to do that, for her to feel compelled to do that, to however many viewers there were at the time, I can imagine maybe just a handful. Today, there's probably hundreds of thousands, if not a million views already. She never thought making that video that so many people would see it and encouraged by it. But she also didn't know that the very next day she would step into eternity. See, I don't try to live off of these bad experiences, but the reality is a thought that occurred to me even tonight as I was in my studies looking at this. I says, you know, those were nine full years. And for her to be nine years old and already declaring her faith in Christ, she lived nine amazing years. In other words, she enjoyed her life to the fullest. And I mean, if you really think about it, guys, listen to this. It doesn't matter how old you are. Some of you are older than others. Some of you are on borrowed time. You're past 70 years old. You need to thank God every day that you're alive. But listen to this. Can you literally look back and say, these were the nine best years of my life? I mean, really think about it. We have to like literally scour through the history of our life and say, well, that year was good. But then all this stuff happened, and, and then this year was good, and then all this stuff happened, but she lived her life to the fullest for nine years. Now, you might say, not enough time. Well, now she has all the time. I mean, you cannot live from the perspective of, of where we are today and think, this is it. Guys, this is it. I mean, hey, what do you got today that you just you know, can't live without your house, your, your, your vehicle, your, your job, your money. How many of you have had money and, and not had money? Anybody here? Okay. Yeah. Come on now. <laughs> How many of you have had a good job and lost a good job? C come on, guys. Look it. Some of you are like, well, I don't like this thing when we're interactive. Pastor Dave gets us, man. <laughs> I mean, really think how many of you have had a really nice car and then you had a lemon? All right. So you understand that you could actually live without everything that this life has to offer. You can live without it. And if all you have is Jesus, whom we have yet to handle physically, but as Jesus told Thomas, Thomas, you believe because you've seen me, you touch me and you handle me, but blessed are they who have not seen and yet still believe. That little girl showed us that having Jesus was all that she needed. That's amazing. I, I want that. that this, is, this is the picture here that, that I think if we were to apply... It doesn't mean you're not going to, God's not saying today, hey, you go throw everything away and give it up. No, God is saying, 
hold on to it loosely. And you ready for this? Hold on not only to possessions loosely, hold on to relationships loosely. Because we're not God. And when God says it's time, it's time. He makes everything beautiful in its time. Difficult to understand. But when we trust God with it all, it is the most powerful way to live. It is the beauty of God's power. Listen to this. It is the gift of God. I know that whatever God does, listen to this, it shall be forever. So in a sense, apart from God, man's work becomes inadequate. Because you work, and guess what? What you work for, you're going to lose. But when God does it, it's eternal. It's forever. And I love what he says here. Nothing can be added to it and nothing can be taken from it. God does it that men should fear before him. That even goes for your life. Listen to this. You can't add a day to your life, nor none of that. Your time is your time. The Bible says it's appointed for man to die, then comes the judgment. And everything that God has for us, listen, you can't, this is, in a sense, just enjoy it. Look to the one who created all things and made them beautiful. The fear of God, the fear of the Lord, nothing can be added or taken away from God's work. You and I, the Bible says, are the workmanship of God. We are the poema, right? Poema, his workmanship. Nothing can be added or taken to it. And listen to this. You might say, I don't really agree with how God's working things out in my life. Listen, if you look at it from the perspective of the flesh and see it from the vantage point of Solomon and say vanity of vanities, all is vanity, this is all messed up, then listen, you're not looking at it from where the Lord is saying, look past the temporal things and look to eternal things. It's the message of Jesus. But that is true. You know, apart from God, I mean... Anything we do, even the life that we live is inadequate. We've all lived our own lives and it's brought us to where we are tonight at the feet of Jesus. I mean, how good did you do on your own? Really think about it. That which is already been and what is to be has already been and God requires an account of what is Pass. What is he saying here? God is in control. What's done is done. God doesn't change his mind, guys. Listen to this. God never changes his mind. He is the unchanging one, right? I, I mean, James chapter 1, right? What is that? Verse 17, that every good and perfect gift comes from above the Father of lights in whom there is no shadow or turning. I mean, that great reminder for every good gift and perfect gift is from above, comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. In other words, God doesn't make mistakes. God doesn't change his mind. And listen to this. You guys ready? God's not surprised by anything. You know, the hard reality for us, I think, a lot of times, remember how as we're reading in Romans 8, he works out things, you know, all for the good for those who love him. But then you got to read those other verses where it says he's predestined, he's justified, he's called. You know, these words, sometimes the Christian community gets afraid of these words because they start to think, well, man, so that means that God already knew all the things that were going to happen in my life, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Yes, everything. And he promises to never leave you nor forsake you, to be with you always. So God keeps track. Let me show you how the Lord keeps track. A psalm that I think is important for you, and maybe somebody here needs to hear this psalm. Psalm 56. 
Look at what it says in Psalm 56 in verse 8. It says, you number my wanderings. In other words, you are with me everywhere I go. Put my tears into your bottle. Not only are you with every step I take, listen, guys, you're with every pain I experience. And look at this. Are they not in your book? In other words, the picture here is that God keeps good record. This is remembrance. God does this because this is the God that we serve. There is nothing, listen to this, guys, that happens in your life that God is not aware of. He numbers your wanderings. He puts his tears into your bottle, and they are all written in his book. And you want to know what? A day is going to come, guys, listen, when all the wrongs will be made right. When the day of reckoning comes, you know, that picture, too, happens when people, you know, step into eternity. It's been said that people say, you know, their life flashes before them. Everything that they've ever done. And that could very well be the case. I mean, we're going to have the picture more on the reality is, I would say, you know, maybe it doesn't happen with a big TV screen and your whole life flashes before you. But, you know, the Bible says in eternity, we're going to know things that we wouldn't normally know here on earth. So I think that that happens not only for those in heaven, I think that happens for those in hell as well, because hell is eternity too. Hell is eternal. It's a real place. So where a person goes, they, it's not that this TV screen flashes, but they're going to have a knowledge. They're going to fully understand, I'm in hell because of how I lived. No question. I'm not going to say, did you get it wrong? Did you make a mistake? No, you're going to know why you're there. That's why the Bible confidently says in Philippians 2 that, that a day will come when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I often tell people, if you need to bow for him now, you will bow for him then. That bowing down even outside of eternity, out, as the book of Revelation describes in chapter 21, outside the wall, there will be liars and cowards and all of these. Listen, those outside are going to know why they're there. They're not going to be like, what happened? What did we miss? Did we miss something? No, they're going to know why. That's what comes with eternity. And our loved ones that are in heaven, they're not going to be up there worried, biting their nails, you know, at the, at the gate and waiting for the name to be read in the book of life. No, the Bible assures us that here on this earth, when we put our faith in Christ, Jesus even told the disciples, your names are written in heaven. We read that this morning in the verse with Pastor Robert Lawrence. That in other words, when we put our faith in Christ, listen, God keeps good track record. And because of Jesus, our name is written in the Lamb's book of life. And when the role, remember that old song, is called of yonder, I will be there. You're not going to be in line up there waiting like, I sure what my name's on there, man, you know. I hope they have my alias. No, listen, it's going to be assured. It's going to be great. Listen to this. You're going to be there, and you know you're in. You know you're in. This is the beauty of God and the goodness of God. This is why we are to fear God. God requires an account of what is past. So God will hold accountable those responsible and even things in our past. So in other words, when does that happen? When we die, we give an account. So God turns it all out for our good. Verse 16, moreover, I saw under the sun. Now remember, under the sun, meaning that he's saying, I'm looking from earth's vantage point. He says, in the place of judgment, wickedness was there, and in the place of righteousness, iniquity was there. This, let me break it down to you, very simple what it says here. That when he saw the earth, he saw it with people praising bad and saying what's bad is good. And then looking at bad and saying this is really good. So in other words, he's saying injustice. And why are we so concerned? Let me tell you why today. And I'm not saying... 
we need to jump on this whole justice thing. People want justice. And yes, you can get caught up in politics. And he actually transitions from that, from, 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 from enjoying life because it's a gift from God and your work and your labor to now justice in politics. This is exactly what he's getting to here. But he's not saying to get lost in these things. The book of Acts says that one day the just one will come. And so people cry justice today and they, they barrage the church and accuse the church of, you know, of being you know, selfish or unloving or uncaring because we're not out there leading the crusade. And then the ones that are leading the crusade with justice in the church are called woke pastors, you know, and we're, we're you know, we got it all wrong and, 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 you know, or if we are not doing that, then we're told that, you know, we're unloving and we're not good. Let me tell you something. Here's what I do know. Is that God didn't call me to picket or to parade or to lead a movement. God called me to build faith in the lives of people. I'm going to preach the gospel. And God is just. This is why we see injustices in the world. Um. Nothing else in God's creation recognizes injustices, just so you know. Why? Because nothing else in this world is created in the image of God except us. And because God is just, we see these injustices. But what does the Bible remind us? That when these injustices rise up, we need not to worry. God will take care of it. Everything will receive its accounting in its time. So Solomon seeing all of this as if there was little or really no justice at all whatsoever. And he looks and he says here, I said in my heart, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time for every purpose and for every work. So he says there's little or no progress. This goes back to that Psalm 73, why do the wicked prosper and the righteous suffer kind of thing? Why, why, is, why is there an imbalance, right? Life is not fair. You know, when kids say things like, um, that's not fair. What's our response as parents? Well, life is not fair. Because kids are the first ones to cry. That's not fair. But ultimately, if you've lived long enough, you realize life isn't fair either. Right? So we live within this, and we know that one day justice will come. We know that one day, listen, as a believer with eternity in our heart because of Christ, we know that one day justice is going to come. And it's going to come when Christ comes. Jesus came the first time to bring salvation. Jesus came the first time to die for your sins. On the third day, he was raised from the dead. This is what we believe, right? And in believing this, you also believe that he's coming again. And at his second coming, he's not going to come as a suffering servant or a lamb. But he's going to come as the lion of the tribe of Judah. And if he came the first time, he's coming a second time. And when he does come a second time, all will see. Because when he came the first time, he was born in obscurity in a manger. In the cesspool of humanity, he left his throne of glory, came to this earth, became man, and was born in a manger, while earth itself was praising its first empire when Rome was in power. Caesar Augustus became the first Roman emperor ever in the history of humanity. And the worship of man began to its fullest extent. While man was clearly showing by their worship of man that they really needed someone to worship, Jesus was born. Galatians 4, 4 says, at the right time, God brought it all together. Why? Because he makes all things beautiful in its time. But Jesus is not going to come in obscurity. The world will be also in the same state where they will be worshiping man. And that man is not going to be Caesar Augustus. It's going to be the Antichrist. And the world is going to be worshiping him. And once again, we see the whole thing shift again. But Jesus will come not in the obscurity in a manger. The Bible says that he will come in the clouds of glory with the church. Because before his second coming, the rapture of the church will take place. 
And Jesus will come and we will rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years here on this earth. So today we live in between, in essence, we live in between an uncertainty about what's next. A lot of people ask me, are we there yet? Especially with the coronavirus and the vaccines. Is that the mark of the beast? And who is the, I don't know who the Antichrist is. I don't care. It doesn't really matter to me. But here, here's what I will tell you. There are things. Now listen, Jesus says, I'll give, you some, I'll give you some ideas. I'll give you some thoughts. You know, look at Matthew chapter 24. I think this is something that we should be, you know, kind of considering. Look at, look at what Jesus says. Jesus says, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. And we're seeing that today. When he says the end is not yet is because in Matthew 24, he goes on to this whole teaching on the tribulation period. The end will come after the tribulation. But what are some of the things that have to happen before the tribulation? Well, number one, the church has to be raptured. And I know there's much debate in the church as to what view of the rapture do you hold? There are those in the church that don't even believe in the rapture. They believe it's a false teaching. But it's biblical. The disciples believed in it. As a matter of fact, Jesus told the disciples that he's going to his father's house and he's going to go and prepare. John chapter 14, verse 1, he says, Let not your hearts be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. For in my father's house are many mansions, and I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again. He's talking about leaving and coming. I'm going to my father's house to prepare a place for you. So he's talking about going where? Where's the father? In heaven. When Jesus told the disciples in Matthew 6, this is how you pray, our Father who art in? Jesus said he was in heaven. So if he says, I'm going to my Father's house, he's going where? To heaven. And then he says, and I will come again and receive you unto myself. In Matthew chapter 26, communion. In verse 26, the Bible says he breaks the bread. We're going to do that tonight. He breaks the bread. And then when he gets to the cup, he says, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until I drink anew with you in my father's kingdom. He's telling the disciples that one day he will be with them in his father's kingdom and they will partake together. That's known as the marriage supper of the lamb. Now think about this. Jesus then in Acts chapter one ascends and the disciples are watching him go into heaven after the resurrection, right? And then the angels appear to them and they say, men of Galilee, why do you stand here gazing in the same manner in which you've seen him taken up? You will see him return again with the clouds of glory. All throughout scripture. This is why they preach this, the rapture of the church, that we will be united with Christ in some way, that we will be together with him. And in Revelation, the church comes back with him at his second coming. Now, I think this is really important for us to get because we don't know when Jesus is coming. But Jesus gave us signs to pay attention to that reveal to us that we're near. So, you know, there has to be a one world religion. You guys know that, right? And obviously there will be if Christianity is out of the scene. I think that this plays a lot. And I don't mean to turn this into a prophecy sermon, but please just indulge with me just a little bit. I think this is important to really pay attention to. Because, you know, when Paul writes to the Thessalonians and he tells the Thessalonians that, you know, a time is going to come when, you know, the restrainer will be removed. And when the restrainer is removed, he says, then the man of sin, the man of perdition, the man of sin, he says, will be revealed. Now, notice this, that, that he goes on to talk about this. He says in uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he says, For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Who is the one who restrains? Who is the one who has to be taken out of the way? Listen to this. And then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, 
and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they do not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. So just in these couple of verses, this is what he's saying. He says, listen, the lawless one that's going to come, he, it's a work of Satan. He's going to deceive many people. That's the Antichrist. But he says the Antichrist cannot come into power unless the restrainer is taken away. The only thing that's hindering the Antichrist to rise into power today, and this is the God on his truth, is the church, the body of Christ. The work of the Holy Spirit, that is the restrainer. You might say, when has the Holy Spirit been a restrainer? Well, go back into the book of Genesis. This, this is who he is. In Genesis chapter 6, what did the Lord say? My spirit shall not strive with man much longer. And God says, I will give man 120 years. So people assume that God was saying the lifespan of man is 120 years. No, the Lord was saying, I'm going to give him that much time to repent. It took Noah that long to get the ark prepared. And ultimately, he destroyed the earth with a flood. The Bible says God was not going to destroy the earth with a flood the second time. But in 2 Peter, in chapter 3, he says, the Lord will destroy the earth with fire. He'll destroy it with fire. And so what we see here is the same pattern has to follow. When the restrainer is taken up, when the church is taken up, then the man of sin will come into power. Guys, listen, when the church is taken up, when Christianity is no longer on this earth, then anything goes. You know that all offshoots of faith that are pretty prominent today are... Its foundation comes from Christianity. They just veer off. They veer off. They want to create a God, but it can never be like our God because, listen, the tomb of all these gurus that started all these are occupied. The tomb of the Lord God is empty. He is risen from the dead. Amen. Guys, listen. So in all of this here, we don't know when the rapture of the church is going to happen. 1 Thessalonians 4.17 says it will happen. And we will be taken up. We will be caught up. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, we will all be transformed. Now, I believe with all of my heart, guys, listen, that we will experience these things. But until that happens. Now, I want to say last week or before the week was over, in Saudi Arabia, you can check this out, an article that just went out, over a hundred people of different faiths, leaders of different faiths, backgrounds, even Christianity, all gathered together for the purpose of unity among all faiths. And Saudi Arabia is pushing this to be the epicenter of that which creates this one world understanding of faith and unity. So I'm not saying that the Antichrist is going to come from Saudi Arabia, you know, but I'll tell you this, that the earth is already preparing itself for someone to come and even take this one world religion. Now, right now, there's too many apologists, too many Christians, too many theologians, too many scholars, too many Bible teachers like David Zamora that are going to be like, dude, that is not legit, that's not truth. And too many Christians that are from the hood because we'll die for whatever we got to die for. That's just how it goes, right? But here's the point. That's why the church has to be gone in order for that deception to take place on this earth. And then we come back with Christ and rule and reign. Remember, really think about this. So we live in this world where we're looking at it and we're saying, wow, you know, we, what do we do then? Do we live in fear and think, oh man, Jesus can come at any moment? No, we live in the fear of God. Enjoy this relationship that God has given us. Live for him with all of your heart. And listen, don't allow your possessions to possess you. Only allow the spirit of God to dwell in you. And you'll learn what it is. God has an appointed time when he's going to deal with wickedness. And when Christ comes back to rule and reign, all these injustices that we say is not right. And it's not just crimes committed against people. You have had injustices in your life. Have anything happened to you as a person? Not a crime committed against you, maybe a loss. And you say, that is not right. It's not fair. 
That comes from your natural, you know, inclination within yourself created in the image of God to say, this is not, this is not fair. You know that even that, God will fix. It's going to happen. God does it. He goes on to say here, I said it in my heart concerning the condition of the sons of men. God tests them that they may see that they themselves, listen to this, are like animals. Yes, apart from God, that's how we live. Men without God are like animals. Psalm 32 and verse 9 says that. We know the story of Nebuchadnezzar who lived like an animal. He lives like a beast and dies like one also. Notice the picture that Solomon is getting. In other words, God is revealing what man is really like apart from him. For what happens to the sons of men also happens to animals. One thing befalls them and one dies, so dies the other. Surely they all have one breath. Man has no advantage over animals for all is vanity. Man and beast. This is interesting. Two things, but yet... They have this in common. Both animals are living just like man is. The only difference between the two, Solomon says, hey, listen, in the end, we both die. But animals don't go into eternity. They have the breath of life, but they don't have a soul. They can't make, they're not created in the image of God. Now, I know people always ask me this question, does my little dog that, you know, my, like my family, and, you know, God bless you if you have those pets. But when they die, where do they go? They cease to exist. Now, did you lead them to Christ? Did they make a conscious decision to live for Jesus? I mean, there's only one way. You can't, you know, that I've had others tell me, well, you know, you know, the unbelieving spouse is justified by the believing one, and I believe my animals are justified. I says, those were kids they were talking about, not animals. But some people treat animals like their own kids. That is all fine. The Proverbs teach us that we, a person who is right with the Lord, treats God's creation right. So God will honor you treating his creation right. But, and some people say, well, could those animals that we see, Jesus comes back at his second coming riding a horse. So are there animals in eternity? Well, obviously there is, but are they your animals that died? I would say no, but I mean, the Bible doesn't teach that because they don't have a soul. I think what we see at Jesus' second coming and the new heaven and the new earth is God putting everything back to what it was when he created it before the fall. But you want to know what? Even people in the church can't see that today. You want to know why? We're blinded and distracted by life, sin, bad decisions, death, sickness, tragedy, loss, pain, riches, everything, and even the church, people in the church, we struggle with this, and, and we live this life harder than we live for eternity. And listen to this. Solomon says, I've done that, and you know what? It's made me a person that finally just looks at man and says, there's no difference between you and an animal. Oh, there's a big difference. Look at what he even goes on to say, all go to one place, all are from the dust and all return to the dust. Well, that is true. Who knows the spirit of the sons of man, which goes upward, and the spirit of the animal, which goes down to the earth. Now, he's not saying, hey, annihilationalism is the thing. Listen, death occurs to all that is living. But the soul of men, we never hear the Bible say the souls of animals. The soul of men is what goes into eternity. Your loved ones that have passed away, let me tell you something right now. For some of you, it might have been, you know, a process and you, you were expecting their day of passing. For some of you, it was too short. It was sudden. It was sad. It was tragic. It was terrible. It was horrible. God doesn't want you to focus on the means by which or how or when a person dies. God wants you to focus on eternity. Because that loved one of yours is more alive now than they ever have been, especially if their faith was in Christ regardless of how they left this earth, that doesn't matter. What matters is not how they die or the manner in which they die, 
but where they put their faith. And if their faith was in Christ, listen to this. Whatever ails you today will never, ever come near to you in eternity. Can I say this to us tonight, that for those of us that have lost friends, family, parents, children, whatever, let me tell you something right now. They are perfect today. Isn't that amazing? Something you always wanted, it's there. <laughs> you got what you wanted. And I'm talking about those in the faith. I'm not talking about those that we assume went to heaven even though they didn't know the Lord. Now, this is the point I'm trying to get across. This is why the Bible says we shouldn't sorrow as people who have no hope. 2 Corinthians 5 says, Be confident of this thing, that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And I know people always have this thing. I've done so many funerals, guys, that I can't even begin to explain to you. But one thing I learned in all these funerals in this last time of the pandemic, 54 funerals to be exact. I learned more about eternity, not because I was reading the Bible, but because I was talking to people and just listening to how their loved one that passed away, whether it was sudden, whether it was COVID, whether it was suicide, whether it was death. It didn't matter what it was, car accident. It didn't matter what it was. And then I realized that the despair of this life. And oftentimes, you want to give them hope. And this is what I told them. They'd say, well, we don't know. I had one person tell me, we don't know if you want to do this funeral because, you know, they, they, you know, they died, they were drunk driving and they, they died. They're the ones that did it. They were. I said, okay, but did they know the Lord? They said, yes. I said, so you think that because they got drunk and they drove and they crashed, that God's like, I'm going to send you to hell for all eternity because you made one mistake. If the Bible says Christ died for our sins, past, present, and future. I says, why were they drinking? They said, they've always struggled with this. I says, you don't think that the Lord is probably saying, hey, it's, it's time to come home. It's too hard for you down there. Come home. If we're his, it's to his discretion when he takes us home. He could take me home tonight. I can be gone. And you guys won't have this cute, chubby little pastor with you anymore. <laughs> and I'm okay with that. If the Lord says tonight is your time, I'm tell you guys right now, if I'm not here tomorrow, you're going to remember these words. Bye, Felicia. <laughs> I'm out. I'm with the Lord. Because I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, no, Lord, don't take me right now. I want to see what happens tomorrow. <laughs> Listen, fear God rather than death. Worship the Lord rather than possessions. Enjoy the life that God has given you. And all of us tonight have experienced pain, some of us to a greater degree. I am no way going to try to disrespect you and say, this is the reason for your pain. But what I will tell you is this. God's not going to waste that pain. You will be rewarded. Why? Because he keeps a good track record. We learned that tonight. So I perceive, as we close tonight, that nothing is better than that a man should rejoice in his own works, for that is his heritage, for who can bring him to see what will happen after him? Who can do that? Well, Nothing. That's the answer here. From Solomon's perspective, nothing because death ends it all. And therefore, ultimately, his life has no more significance or meaning than the life of an animal. Well, I'll tell you what. Because of who Christ is, we have a hope. Amen? Amen. We don't have to live this sad statement that Solomon says here. What happens? Who knows what's going to happen? So be content in whatever state you're in. The, God has, the Lord God has great things for us. Amen. Father, we thank you.